Thank you, everyone. Um, so just getting started, um, the whole um, Web3 department solely operates um, on the blockchain. And when we say NFTs, non-fungible tokens, I am not referring to an NFT as the artwork. It, um, with us, it operates as a certificate of authenticity. Um, so when you buy the artwork um, as an NFT, we will still provide you the artwork file and all like these other um, um, things that you wouldn't you might get on an NFT marketplace. Um, so moving on to defining the contemporary digital landscape. Um, a lot of people within the Web3 community um, often think digital art has only been around for five years. Um, as we know, standing in this room, that is not the case. And that's why when we have entered this space um, as an art commercial entity, we really want to bring this um, historical conversation. Um, we want to make these connections. Oh. Um, and as well as how do we experience digital art today, um, primarily with digital art that was produced and consumed on a computer or phone. So the rise of NFTs, um, I'm very critical of the ecosystem I work in. Um, marketplaces have become the new discovery tool, but they're not developing artists or their careers. Um, artists have this connection directly to collectors, which is an amazing opportunity. However, no one's giving them critical feedback of, maybe you should do this, or maybe that's not working and I've seen better work from you, or have you thought about this um, book to read to develop something? Um, as well as, um, again, contextualization, um, contextualization and there's emphasis on trading. Since anyone can go and buy an artwork, um, there has been an emphasis on who has the most money to get it, access to it first. It might seem more democratic, but now we kind of have this term of whales, people coming in with a lot of money and swooping up what they consider to be the best artwork. And so a lot of collectors actually don't have access to this art. Um, the lack of curation, both externally and internally. A lot of artists um, are not curating their work anymore or kind of creating narratives around it. They're just producing. Um, the role of cur curation and display, um, which I'll talk about a little more. However, a good couple of things that have risen about that Ira talked about a little bit is community at its core. You cannot succeed in Web3 without a vibrant vocal community. Um, a lot of these community members um, come from a variety of backgrounds as technologists, traders, finance. They don't come from traditional art backgrounds, but they have taken up the roles of curators, narratives, writers. And it's a very interesting in, um, ecosystem and conversations that are happening. And so with this, um, the rise of AI, long form, and generative art has come with this community. So um, I mentioned FX Hash there is, and Art Blocks. These are two um, of some of the most known projects. There are about 700 outputs of a generative system, the top one being Meridians by Matt Deslaurier, who's based in London, and then Fidenza um, by Tyler Hobbs. Um, these artworks have grabbed probably the news headlines that you've seen. For example, one of these 700s by Tyler's um, just last week was realized at Sotheby's for 1.2 million, just one of the 700. However, um, generative art is fascinating long form. Um, it's a new art form on the rise. Generative art has existed, as we know, since the 1960s in a relationship with a computer. But new on-chain generative art platforms are pushing the medium in an exciting new direction. While many of the generative techniques are the same, the goal of the program output are wildly different from before. The direct path of the script to the viewer, as well as a large number of iteration, encourages the artist to create a special class of artistic algorithm, and furthermore has widely changed the role of curation. In essence, it has foregone curation completely, uh, where the first time the artwork is seen is when the collector engages in a purchase. The act of randomness employs what exists, um, and from there, the community determines quality. Long-form generative art introduces new demands, demands of consistency and quality in high variety while maintaining the existence um, need for unity across the output of a program. Right now, few artists, in my opinion, are capable, capable of navigating this balance, but I have no doubt that this will soon change. Um, it's wildly become popular and almost has a cult-like following. Um, and again, um, this is why as a kind of um, art gallery we wanted to move in this space. While long form exists on these platforms, short form's not really being championed, um, where artists are having um, kind of more curated outputs, and that's where we come in, as well as we do long form with a variety of artists. So the role of curation. Um, these are more questions that we ask ourselves um, kind of this last year when putting together um, our program. How does AI, generative, and digital artworks fit into art history in the current contemporary art space? Meaning, um, when an artist is producing these works, 
um, what is it in relation to? Is it, a it can't be in its own little vacuum. And we often have to educate a lot of the artists that we work with of, you might have not even known that this was already produced visually or aesthetically or it's already in conversation with something. Um, how do we create a vernacular in writing that discusses the hard technicality of these systems and code, but upholds like art tradition? Um, one really interesting thing that we're trying to discuss is how do you do a visual analysis of code? Um, each coder will tell you that you have their own unique style, and that should just be discussed just as you would describe a painter's um, brushstroke. Um, and so these are things that I think are gonna be guiding the next generation of art historians. Um, as well as um, the audience that we um, bring in. How do we curate an uneducated audience that doesn't understand the technology behind these artworks? I, as well as a hard discussion we have with artists is process and output. How are they um, curating their outputs when they almost have unlimited numbers? What um, is the determination this one is the best when saying this is my artwork? Why not the other 100,000? So one thing when we do a physical thing that I, ha I love talking about is the standard between commercial and institution. A lot of people uphold commercial entities to the same value of institutions, and that shouldn't be. Um, and there's a variety of factors in that. Um, there is overlapping conversation, of course, um, but one of the main things that is uh, difficult is funding. Um, so a lot of, in Web3, the shows that you see are grassroots. Um, there is no anyone putting up the bill, um, maybe a patron if you're lucky. So it's quite um, gritty in certain ways. So the top one's from a uh, location in Paris, NFT factory, that is actually the opposite of Centre de Pompidou. And then down below is Rafik's installation at the MoMA. I can tell you, I don't know the actual figures, but the Rafik's screen is probably 800,000 USD to produce. While the above was on a much more skimpy um, budget. And this is really hard when you wanna bring this digital artist into the physicality um, because there's a lot of limiting factors. I also can't have um, as many academic conversations as I want to because of, um, with different art historical figures. Um, if we wanna saw Lewitt in conversation to the art, um, computer artists today, um, we might not have the right security, the temperature. All these things are in consideration when we do commercial shows. As well as we have the goal, we need to make money as well for these artists and develop their careers. So, how do we bring this into the physical zone? And there's a variety of ways that we've done this. One show that we did um, was called Inner Code for Freeze. Um, in this, um, I'll use the example of Casey Reese. Um, he um, and Ben Fry created processing and he was kind of the leading figure in one of these shows. And this was a long form project um, that he um, selected a few um, artworks from. Um, the show was almost like a maze and our goal is we wanted to bring an uneducated audience to learn more about generative art. And we thought the baseline of learning about generative art, if you had to learn one thing from the show, was input output. And so how did we have a viewer that knows nothing about coding or tech learn this? Um, it was a very intimate show and um, again a maze. So on the right hand side there was a screen and then on the left hand side the artist chose an object to in, um, reflect upon um, their input. And it was left to the viewer to make that relationship of how did the input get to the visual output. So again it's curating not solely on the aesthetic value but trying to encourage the viewer to dive deeper into how this relates. Um, and again the viewers step in physically into that relationship and became the autonomous system. So this is just one example. One other um, generative project that recently came about that I wanna talk about that has been fantastic is Unreadable by Operator um, on Art Blocks from last week. So um, Operator is an artistic duo, Anya and Catherine and Daisha T, um, and is an on-chain on generative choreography. Huna Unreadable immerses audience and collectors in a three-act embodied generative art experience. It acts, um, weaves together code, choreography, blockchain, and generative art, cryptography, and performance into an evolving conceptual experience to what they describe as a slow recovery of the human. The br work brings flesh and verse reality into code and vulnerability into long-form chain generative art performance, and each work is driven by the motion data of underlying unique on-chain um, choreography sequence. One interesting thing I want to highlight about this is these outputs solely live on your computer and phone. However, when they display their work, it is actually a performance. They do not display the um, JPEGs of sorts. 
Um, and I think that's a really interesting um, conversation to have is if you're creating this work solely in the system, is that actually how you want to display it? And is that how you should display it? And these are kind of conversations we're having in the commercial space as well. So kind of ending on issues we're facing, the middleman doesn't exist. Us as a gallery, um, we get a lot of flack in the space trying to um, have these curatorial conversations, bringing contributors in, because a lot of people just want that relationship of collector to artist. Um, there's a lack of critique and conceptual frameworks. Everyone's too nice. Um, there is no critics on Twitter. Um, and this, I think, is a really big problem, is if you say you don't like something in this space, people freak out. And that's not a healthy art ecosystem. Um, archiving, how do we present, document, and preserve these pieces? Whose responsibility is it? Um, currently, no one has an answer to this. Is it on the artist to archive these? Because it's that direct artist to collector relationship. And so moving forwards, um, again, um, audience, this is just a top line kind of entry into NFTs and Web3. Audience and, key, and community are at its core, and I think in the next generation, of curating this um, artwork, um, art as experience, is really going to be critical, as someone mentioned John Dewey earlier. Um, but things that we should be considering, um, and we're considering in our programming, is preservation, discovery, contextualization, and education of process and skill. Perfect, thank you.